edition of the digital download, which, which is, is. <laughs> the longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live, now globally syndicated on the IBGN network. You, you, you got Today, your intro patter right, but we yes. forgot a joke, didn't we? Well, 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 well I, 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 I do have one prepared. We, we can't. No, don't break. worry. We're too late now. How about it? That ship sailed. <laughs> that, that ship sailed. Well, yeah. you know, I, I was flustered. We started a little bit late. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, but, did, but did, if but, you could. But, but honestly, though, did you hear about the first restaurant that opened on the moon? First restaurant that opened on the moon? No. No, I didn't. The food was fantastic, but oh. there was no atmosphere. I thought you were going to say it was out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the hidden challenges of software design, especially for those of us with a non-technical background. We have a special guest, Brian Childress, to help us with the discussion. A principal technical advisor, software architect, and fractional CTO at Summit Labs, as well as a Techstars mentor, Brian has spearheaded numerous projects, aiding early stage companies in developing cutting edge software products. But before we bring Brian on, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. Um, and while we're doing that, why don't you in the audience reach out to a friend, ping them and have them join us. We strive to make the digital download an interactive experience. Audience participation is highly encouraged. So, yes, please. with that, introductions. Adam. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Gray. I'm co-founder of DLA Ignite, and I'm uh, I'm delighted to be part of this group of exceptional individuals. You know, the fun of these broadcasts, and yeah, and, and you as well. Uh, yes. The fun, the fun of these these uh, these broadcasts, and the debates that we have, and the things that we learn. Uh, certainly the things that I learn, I just find incredibly valuable and rewarding. Adam, oh. nobody said we were going to learn anything. Oh, that's a good point. Good point. But but the yes. fact that we do sometimes is a real bonus, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Welcome. Occasionally Alex. learning occasionally learning the odd dad joke. Um, no. but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um it's very kind, Adam. I too enjoy these uh, weekly therapy sessions. Um <laughs> So I'm uh, I'm Alex Abbott, founder of Sapiro, creator of the Conversation Operating System, and uh, I'm a proud partner of DLA Ignite, and uh, looking forward to uh, to turning this into an exciting conversation on this wonderful Friday afternoon. Excellent. Hi, Sammy. Thank you for that. And I'm Rob Durant, founder of Flywheel Results. We help startups scale. And I am a proud DLA Ignite partner. So thank you for that. Um, as I said, this week on the digital download, we'll speak with Brian Childress. His extensive experience in software development and deep insight into the startup ecosystem make him an invaluable resource for anyone looking to navigate the complexities of tech in the business world. Brian. Good morning and welcome. Yeah, good, good morning. To it's great to be here, guys. Thank you for joining us today. We have a we have another double door situation going on. We we <laughs> yes, Tracy, Tracy and double Tracy, as well. <laughs> Tracy last week was I think at a mum's place, and there were two doors behind, and it looked like you know is it the is it the blue door or the red door we have to walk through? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So is one, well, a, is one a closet or are they both doorways into different parts of the house? One's a closet, yep. Okay. Oh, one leads to Narnia. For which one? <laughs> <laughs> Brian, let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about you, how you got here, and, and, and um, then we'll jump into the, the topic for today's discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, so... Uh, like you mentioned in the intro, my name is Brian Childress. I'm a, a fractional CTO and, and software architect. 
Uh, the journey to get here has not been a, a straight or smooth one uh, by any means. Um, I've spent the last 12 or 15 years uh, developing software for uh, healthcare and um, finance, uh, consumer SaaS products that you may know and love. Uh, and, you know, I've had an opportunity to work on a lot of different projects with a lot of different teams in a lot of different technologies. And I think all of that experience has really been really impactful for me. I've grown and learned a lot. Uh, I think we're seeing it. The technology is just super, super exciting. And I think that's what keeps me uh, going every day is just being involved and, and continuing to learn and see how we can use technology to solve everyday problems. Excellent. Thank you. So, Brian, I see posts and ads all the time for no code solutions. Apparently, even I can build an app. So when I come to my IT team and ask, can we just implement this great idea that I have? It should be easy. Why are simple software solutions not as straightforward as they might appear? So you used two interesting words that we hear a lot in software. You said just and should, right? <laughs> should be easy. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not. You know, Those are true four-letter words in the software industry. Because there's a lot of complexity that goes into those solutions. There's a lot of concerns depending on the business or the industry that you're operating in around the type of data and where the data lives and who has access to certain types of data. What type of functionality do we need? Um, you know, how many users are going to be on the system and, and at what times? And all of those things kind of come into play for what is the solution that we're looking to do? And I think a lot of businesses struggle from that same sort of thing. I've certainly been in organizations where the IT team would say, oh, well, that's going to take six months for us to even have time to consider um, what's, uh, you know, how long it's going to take. And it's a real challenge. And so what we see a lot of times is other members in the organization will build software solutions, you know, typically on Excel or, you know, for those of us, uh, that remember, you know, Microsoft Access and some of those platforms, um, you know, it's really, really interesting uh, how those tend to evolve. Um, access wasn't, wasn't uh, access joining the... us a little bit late to the party. We have uh, Tim Sorry, I'm late. jumping in. Tim, good morning and welcome. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? No worries. You good morning. Good morning. So wasn't Access so, the uh, the tool that you used when Excel ran out of space? <laughs> <laughs> For many, That's a good way of describing it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been in organizations where millions of dollars worth of transaction flowed through Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Access databases every day because the IT team, you know, wasn't able to build that custom software solution. And I think uh, for me, I see that as really the precursor to a lot of the low code and no code tools that we have today, right? A lot of us became Excel wizards as part of our day job. And that kind of gave us that superpower to be able to create software. And really that's a lot of what I do day to day. I just have maybe some different tools with different names that have different capabilities. Brian, what are some common misconceptions about software development among non-technical professionals like myself? I think the biggest misconception that I see that I think hurts a lot of folks, non-technical or technical, is that they build something that they don't actually need. Uh, and to give you a little bit of background here. So what I when I work with founders and, and folks, uh, and different teams, and they have this idea, right? I have this fantastic idea and I need an app for that. And so I need to go and find somebody that can build apps. And there are a lot of people all around the world that are willing to take your money to build that app. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of times the thing that we're trying to solve doesn't necessarily need an app. It doesn't need a custom software solution, but we tend to go down that road, especially as non-technical folks, because that's how we, what we tend to uh, uh, understand or, or uh, conflate with a technical solution is I need something that's complex and hard and costly and takes a long time to build. And usually that's not the case. 
Um, back to kind of my earlier example where a lot of companies are using Excel spreadsheets to do their day-to-day -day business, a lot of times that's sufficient. Uh, but if we start to get it into our mind that we need to build this technical solution, that's the route we go down and we don't really kind of look back and make sure that we're headed in the right direction. Okay. So how do you manage expectations when a non-technical uh, client or team members propose ideas that are more complex than they realize? I think it's important to really look at why are they suggesting that particular solution? You know, there's some sort of driving factor behind it. Um, maybe they are concerned about uh, the stability of the system. So they want to make sure that it has you know, such a robust set of tools and architectures that the system can never go down or can never be unavailable. And so really for me, instead of, you know, kind of saying that the technology that they've chosen is bad or it's too complex, I try to get to the underlying driver behind it. What is it that we're trying to do? What are we trying to eliminate as a possibility? And using that to then help decide some of the technical decisions. And then for me, uh, you know, kind of dialing back some of that complexity is really where I spend a lot of my time. And so I want to focus on what is the simple version of that? You know, I think Tim Ferriss says it often, like, what would easy look like? Uh, what would it mean for it to be easy? Because then if we can solve that problem and we can do it quickly and easily and cost effective, then cool, we can move on with other things that we want to do instead of spending our, head, our time kind of building this super complex thing that at the end of the day, we never needed. So, so when you say app, are you referring to something which sits on your desktop or on your servers or on your mainframe, or are you referring to something that sits on your phone? Uh, I think <laughs> all of the above. Yeah, you, you see that a lot, right? Uh, for many of us, our, our cell phones are our, you know, tether to the world. They yeah. are that, that gateway, um, that ultimate distraction device. And so that's what we think about. Oh, I need an app for this thing. And it, or it could be something that's a, a website or, you know, a, a desktop app. Um, and so that's one of the areas that I spend a lot of time is just making sure we're using the same word in the same way, right? We have the same definition because my version of app and your version of app could be very, very different. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, I kind of, in the early days of mobile stuff, you know, where smartphones were relatively new, um, shipping large amounts of data was costly and problematic because you know we had 3g we didn't have 4g 5g lte whatever um and the advantage for me the user for having an app was that lots of the content was embedded in the app so not much data needed to move between you and me and the advantage for you in building an app was you had a footprint on my home screen which mm -hmm. you wouldn't have had if i'd have accessed you through a, a database a, a, a web page rather but I, I think that a lot of the kind of issue when people set about building these things is that uh although we're not big into kind of like design and marketing and stuff like that uh, the problem is that people don't invest any thought or often don't invest any thought in how it actually works and how it actually looks so what you end up with is something where the user interface is a bit like the back end interface of a, a, a cms system and, and it just looks clunky and pointless. And, and, I, and I often think that, that when people set about building apps uh, and, and resources like that, they're very poorly conceived from end to end. They've got an idea, as you said, about the problem they're trying to solve, but not what that actually looks like. And, and I think that, that often the issue with this is that, that it creates a bad experience for everybody involved. So there are times when an app is absolutely the right thing to do and times when it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But I've never built an app. So, OK, let's 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 do an app, shall we? <laughs> no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And many times we think, uh, you know, oh, I've got a problem. Let's start building an app. And then we just start building. Right. We just start putting things together the way that we understand the problem, you know, or the way that we want to solve the, the particular problem. And, you know, that's how those, you know, internal apps or those super clunky apps, like you say, come to be, right? We just start bolting on more and more and more functionality and we don't, you know, necessarily take time to either revisit, you know, what it is that we're building um, or, or start from a, a good foundation. Uh, so, yeah, it, 
there can be a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, you know just complexity that comes into those apps over time because we don't stop and, and kind of reflect on what we've built so far and are we going in the right direction? Yeah, so 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 I'm I'm a typical uh, business person that might think to myself, uh, let's let's do an app for this. You know, Tim and I are in a board meeting, and I say to Tim, Look, I've got a really great idea, mate. I think that we should build an app for the DLA product offering. And what, what is the process that we should go through in order that we don't invest a huge amount of time and money and effort in something which is bound to fail? Because Tim might be equally wowed by the idea of us having an app, or he, he might be the voice of reason, and he might say, well, what do you want to build an app for? But he might not. So, so how, how do we put the brakes on that and really think about this in a strategic kind of way? So there's a couple things. At first, I want to understand what is it that we're trying to do, right? Not we want to build an app, but I need to send out emails in an automated fashion once a week. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. How can we solve that? How do we solve that now? And then try to refine that process. And a, a friend of mine calls it pain driven development. So on the software side, we have a lot of things that we do that uh, around how do we develop software. And so pain driven development is let's do this process that we're trying to automate, that we're trying to build an application for, let's do it in a manual way and let's figure it out and let's kind of iron out the pieces. Um, and then once we understand what the process is, then we have a heck of a lot better understanding of do we need to build an app and what does that app need to start to look like? Uh, and so really starting with, Let's solve the problem and then we're going to layer on top technology. And I think a lot of times the projects that we see fail go the other direction. They start mm -hmm. with the technology and then we try and bolt on problems to it. Yeah, the, the, the app becomes a solution looking for a problem, doesn't it? Exactly. And, and, you know, the user compares it to the website, let's say, for argument's sake. And they go, well, why would I put this on my phone? Because it works just as effectively on the website. Right. And I need to use it once a month and so there's no reason for me to have that yeah so brian you mentioned um bolt on a couple of times now and i know when you and i first talked you gave me um an understanding of tech debt and so on but i want to come back to the original question brian this is easy why can't you just add this button what is going on behind the scenes that i as a uh, non-technical user don't understand, especially when it comes to that interactivity and tech debt and so on that you were explaining to me before. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. And so you used two of my favorite four-letter words in software development, just and easy. Uh, so let's say, for example, uh, Rob, you come to me and you say, we just need to add this button where I can download a CSV of the data that I'm looking at, right? There's a big table on the website that shows data for you know, past customers or invoices or something like that. Brian, just add a button for me to download that CSV. Okay. So as a, you know, someone that may not be familiar with the, the technology or with the solution that we already have in place, some of the, the technology decisions that kind of got us to where we are, that adding that button could be you know, potentially a six week endeavor. Uh, if we're not careful, it could be a six month endeavor because what sits behind that button is the things that I'm thinking about from a technology standpoint. What does it mean for me to be able to download that CSV uh, or that data in the, a CSV format? How much data? Where is it coming from? Do you have access to it? Do you have access to all of that data? Is there certain data that needs to be masked or anything along those lines? Uh, so there's a lot of complexity that sits behind me adding a button to a website that you have the ability to click. Really, I'm thinking about that functionality that sits behind it. And that can really open that you know, proverbial can of worms when we start to get into it. Uh, and, and technical debt can play a big role in you know, what is it going to take to just add that button to the website. So, so you, you've both used the expression technical debt. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to assume that everyone in this call is an idiot. So what does technical debt mean? You know, what's what's the, the fool's guide to that? 
I wish I could give you a, a great answer. Uh, I think it, it varies across individual developers, across teams and projects. So typically technical debt is something that is restricting us from continuing to move forward effectively uh, and safely. Um, and so, but a lot of times technical debt, we, we use that as a big bucket on the technology side and just say, well, anything I don't like, I'm gonna call that technical debt because then I potentially have an opportunity to actually replace the thing that I don't like. It may not be bad, it may not, you know, it, it continues to work and, and solve business problems, but I can't I can't replace it unless I call it technical debt. And so I think that's where it, we hear a lot on the business side, man, we just are overburdened with technical debt. Uh, we just have so much and really, it's anything that's not allowing us to serve our customers in an effective way. Um, I actually thought of the um, board game Mousetrap when you were explaining it to me. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's played Mousetrap, but it had all these little plastic pieces. It was very much like a, a Rube Goldberg illustration where you add this one piece and then you add this next one. And, and suddenly what I think of is technology which is streamlined and smart it's got to be smart it's smarter than me is actually on the back end this amalgam of band-aids and rubber bands and bubble gum holding everything together and adding that one more rubber band to the piece while i thought it should be simple could cause the whole thing to to snap and, and that was that was surprising to me actually that what I see as simple is not because of all of the things that came before it, all of the, the legacy technology into the, the programming. Am I, am I off base? Am I just you know, remembering a fun game from childhood, but nowhere near correct? It was a great description, uh, Rob. Yeah. Well. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that's a great analogy. Uh, the game of Mousetrap is a, a perfect kind of mental framework for how software gets built and where it gets overburdened with, you know, tech debt and that sort of thing. That's a lot of times why we see software projects tend to only uh, last for about five to seven years on average. After that, it's either we throw it away and completely rewrite it. We go with another solution or we just kind of live with the way things are. So what are some strategies for non-technical people to employ to effectively navigate and contribute to software development. I know nothing, but I know what I need. How can I help you? Help me to understand like your business, the thing that you're trying to solve really, you know, um, where, uh, you know, non-technical founders and subject matter experts can really provide the most uh, value to a project is really just what is it that we're trying to solve? How do you do it now? Like just, you know, I love when I have an opportunity to kind of actually sit next to someone who's doing the job day to day that we're trying to add software to or automate in some way and just kind of sit back and just watch how they work. Like, are they going to three or four different programs to capture data? Are they copying from one and pasting in another? Like, just let me see how that works. You know, is is email involved? Is there other communication platforms? Are you know what's the delay? What are the the pieces that you're missing? When I can understand that, then you know I I have that that technical background. I know how we can solve some of these problems. Then we can start to just layer on technology when and where it makes sense. Um, so really, you know, I encourage folks to just tell me what you do day to day. Where are your pain points? Because uh, again, back to those definitions, like when you say you want something, let's say in real time, your definition of real time and mine as a technologist are completely different. And if we're not careful um, and I don't ask the questions of what do you mean by real time or what do you mean by this particular word, then I'm going to take my assumptions, my you know lived experience and put that into the software. And then it's going to go over budget, go over time, all of those sorts of things, and ultimately be the thing that you didn't need. Um, so just let me, let me ask a bunch of questions. Um, and, you know, almost to an annoying degree, I think is where you can really be most helpful. Isn't there the, though the issue that, and I, I get what you say about um, 
you have to talk to the the people that are doing the job uh, about where are the pain points where are the bottlenecks how can that be streamlined i think a a, a potential challenge though that i see in that is that uh, people don't know and and by that i mean they they don't know what can be changed and what can't be changed so a good example of this would be you know, 25 years ago when I was working in an office and somebody was preparing an invoice, they would say, uh, initial site visit, space, 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 50 pounds. And then new line. And then they'd fill up the page with spaces because they didn't know about A, the tab key, and B, creating specific tabs or even decimal tabs for the numbers that were going to sit on the right hand side of the page and they would not have foreseen spaces as being an issue it's just what you have to do and it's only you as the expert that can look at it and say well actually you can save 500 keystrokes in every single one of these that you ever produce by by learning this technique and i, I think that to a certain extent um we particularly in such a fast-paced industry you know we as a business are on the periphery of that industry we help people in that industry but we're not actually coders and whatever and the issue with that is that we don't know what's possible and what isn't really so how, how do you kind of help open people's eyes to what what that utopian view of perfection could be i think as technologists a big part of my role is that education. And for, you know, technologists, the, the stereotypical, you know, we just want to sit in our, you know, dark rooms with our hoodies and, and code all day. Um, not, not as many people in the industry are actually, you know, that type of person. And so a lot of us have the opportunity. And I, you know, I think it's, it's really in large part, part of our job to understand how can we work with folks that may not also be technologists and helping them to understand some of those capabilities, some of those possibilities. Uh, and so, you know, a large part of my job needs to be, how can I share, oh, here's an exciting thing. We have all of this internal data within our business, or we have this regular process that I see you doing, and it's taking you, you know, 15 minutes to put together. And with, you know, some slight tweaks here and there, you know, we can make that a much more efficient and even, you know, much more productive uh, solution and just really bringing that to the surface. And so I think for me, I'm always looking for those areas and opportunities for efficiency because that's what software is, right? It's just, it's making things more efficient and more, you know, less error prone and kind of eliminating a lot of that, you know, just cruft around how we work day to day. And so, you know, I take it as my job to try and find those little areas where we can improve day to day processes and efficiencies and then bring how that. Often, to the how often do you find that IT goes out to the field, uh, visits the, the sales department, for example, or the marketing department to just observe and recognize where there are opportunities and who's the onus on for facilitating that is that the responsibility of marketing for example to reach out to it and say please come by and observe is that it's responsibility to say hey we're going to regularly go out and and meet with you to to watch what you're doing everyone's already working 28 hours a day when do they find time to to do that what should be done in that regard it's to answer your first question, Rob, no, they don't go out enough, right? It, a lot of times, you know, there's either a, a physical wall or a virtual wall where, okay, IT, stay over here and, and do your IT things. And then the rest of the company is going to be over here, you know, making enough money to pay for you guys to do whatever it is you do. And I think what we're seeing, and I hope that we continue to see in the industry, is there's more of a shift where those software engineers and the IT folks are coming out and working directly with business stakeholders and really having those conversations early and often. Um, and I, I think really for me, on from my perspective, the onus is on me as a technologist to go out and find those areas of efficiency, find those opportunities where instead of all of us working 28 hours, maybe we can reduce that down to 23 hours that we're all working because I know what we can do with software 
let me show you ways that we can improve your workflow. And, you know, it, it may be something very, very small and simple for me, from my perspective, but for you, that could change everything, right? That could bring two days back into every month that you know, that's now available for you to do other things. And what about the communication gap? We've just in this conversation used words differently and kudos to you for recognizing when my definition of uh, real time and your definition of real time were two completely different things. But how do we uh, go about intentionally uh, defining these things without seeming to, to talk down to the other party? That's a really, really tough one. It really is. Um, and both being the one presenting information and the one receiving information, I think we have to really come into the conversation with the expectation that, hey, we're all trying to row in the same direction. We're all trying to solve the same problem and, and serve our customers the best that we can. And so I think it's really important to kind of come into the conversation, you know, with our guards down a little bit and just open to receiving that type of information. Um, and for me, I, I like to be the dumbest one in the room. I like to ask the questions that I, you know, I may know the answer to, but I want to make sure that the folks that may not feel comfortable asking the questions will at least hear the answer. And so, when we throw around a lot of terms or TLAs, three letter acronyms, and we assume that, oh, well, you know, everyone in this room, virtual or, or physical room knows what that means, right? Because we've all been in the same industry. No, we haven't. We don't all have that same experience. And so, you know, I, I, I will be the one that will take that hit to my ego or whatever it may be to ask those questions so that I know that we're you know, hopefully on the same page. Um, it, it's it's important to just kind of put ourselves out there and be willing to ask those questions for clarity, um, because you know, taking being willing to do that versus uh, you know potentially going down a completely wrong path, costing us a ton of time and money because we weren't willing to ask that. Hey, what did you mean by real time, Rob? Type of question. And and Rob. Rob, yes, it's okay to talk down to people. <laughs> is it really, Alan? <laughs> Adam, is, is it really? Andy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, uh, Brian, how do you balance pushing for innovative solutions while keeping projects practical and grounded in business realities on, on both sides of, of that equation, really? How, from a technical point of view, would you do that? And then maybe give some insights for a non-technical person pushing, advocating for their side of it. As far as like continuing to really, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to solve business problems, right? In order for the business to be successful, we're trying to bring in automation and software and technology. And when the business is successful, you can continue to pay my big fancy software engineering salary. And so it's we have to really focus on solving those problems. Um, and I, I really want to make sure that we uh, are also innovating. And so that's where as technologists, again, kind of part of my job is to see where those new and evolving technologies are going. What is coming out in the industry? And then, you know, I treat it like an engineering problem. How can I bring we'll use the the um, the technology of the the year here ai how can i bring ai into my organization right there's a lot of things that we may be able to streamline or improve by bringing that technology into the organization now we have to be very careful because some of those leading edge and bleeding edge technologies as fast as they come into existence they can also go away and so we have to be very careful about what we bring into the organization and what we kind of build our business on top of or our business processes. Uh, so it's it's a very, very delicate balance, um, but it always has to go back to what is the problem that we're solving for the business and are we doing that in the best, most efficient way? Uh, if it's going to take me six months to implement something that's clunky, then I didn't do my job. 
Uh, and so I take a lot of ownership as a technologist to make sure that we're you know, pushing uh, in the right direction. And what about pushing back? Uh, what about the non-technologist that comes to you and says, uh, Brian, uh, AI is everywhere in sales. My sales team needs more AI. Um, can you get us some AI, please? As though you were walking just down the grocery shelves and on the cereal aisle. Oh, you know, let me add this to, to the An AI that prevents cards. me from spilling my tea on my desk. Right? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, it's coming. It's, uh, you know, it'll be out next year. Uh, there's a lot of, um, so I, for me, I, I want to understand why. And so, you know, asking the five whys of, okay, what is it that you're trying to get out of that? What, when you say you want AI, do you want AI so that you can put it on your website that this is an AI driven solution? You know, that's a different AI than, you know, I want to streamline the content that we put together for our newsletters that we send out or uh, blog content or something like that. So really trying to understand, okay, when you say AI, why? What is it that you're looking for, right? Because there's some sort of driver behind that. And a lot of times, um, I think we, as technologists, we don't ask why enough. What is it that you're trying to solve? And so it was like, ooh, we get to add AI. And then you just kind of go off into your, you know, your little cubby hole and add a bunch of stuff that didn't actually need, but it cost a lot of money and cost a lot of time to get there. And that's, I think when we hear that, I think it's like 70% on average of software projects fail. I think it's because we hear those terms right? and we add it into a project and you didn't actually need it. We heard the same thing, I don't know, seven, eight years ago with blockchain. Everything needed blockchain. Nothing needed blockchain at that time, right? There were very specific use cases that it, where it made sense, but there were a lot of projects that added it just because it was new and shiny. You said 70% fail? Yeah. Um, I, I'm surprised it's so low, frankly. Depending no, on I'm which, actually you know, surprised it's so high because I worked for an enterprise level organization that was regularly rolling out this software development and that software development and not a one of them failed now <laughs> we stopped using them within a month of training but they were complete successes just ask the it team and the the project sponsor i guess your uh, definition of success and mine might be a little bit different rob <laughs> that, that, that could be <laughs> but i, I so, think i think that there's a very real risk that that development of bespoke software um, enhances the problem rather than the solution. So you spoke earlier, Brian, about uh, email marketing automation and stuff like that. That'd be a great example of this. So, um, and we're seeing it at the moment with the advent of AI helping people to rewrite things and create more effective, I use the word in quotes, more effective scripts. Um, and the problem is one of an overwhelm that everybody gets from this kind of communication. Uh, you know, we we all are looking for a solution, but the solution is one of how do we stop this influx of, of email that we get because it's an interruption to, to all of us. And often, you know, uh, your idea of you know, you've 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 commissioned this tool, which is going to enable you to send more emails that are more targeted. And then you start to do that. And then Alex says, well, actually, Brian's got this great idea and he's sending out more emails now and they're more targeted. So I need to have that as well. And then Tim decides he needs to have it. And then Rob decides he needs to have it. So now the problem is that I'm receiving four times as much email. And actually, the problem was never how many emails you send out. The problem was that the people don't know who you are, so they never consume the emails. And, you know, I, I think we see that time and time again where, um, so we've, we've had a, a, a clinical psychologist on this show and she said, humans are hardwired to be lazy. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's easy for you to, to walk the short route rather than the long route, you'll walk the short route. And I think that often, you know, things are commissioned as a shortcut, you know, a silver bullet, a magic button, an easy button that will make everything work more effectively. And many times it just enhances the issue, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So now if I'm receiving four times more email, then I'm just going to use the AI to filter out those emails that I'm not reading. Right. 
Uh, so I'm using one tool to fight the other. Uh, but no, you're absolutely right. So so, so how, how do you balance those two things? Because, and, and, and I know that, uh, you know, the challenge that every company faces. So, you know, if you think about your company, uh, so you help organizations make, uh, uh, develop software to solve specific issues. The more of those you sell, the more organization, the more you're able to build people. That means your company is more successful. I'm saying your company, but this is true of every organization out there. Um, and your issue is not whether or not this compounds the problem. Your issue is that you're now selling more stuff. And that's the same for Alex that's that's commissioned his, his email marketing automation. The thing is, he's got the jump on Tim and Rob. So the great news is that he gets a 15% uplift in sales only for the next three months. And then after that, the problem is compounded because he's got this expensive tool that's not now generating any re any revenue because everybody's got the same thing. And it isn't part of the issue that that uh, it's very easy to copy stuff. It's very easy for me to look at what you're doing and, and develop something which is broadly similar. And in fact, standing on the shoulders of giants and all that may be even better than the product that I'm copying. Um, and whether it compounds the problem is actually not a concern of mine. What is a concern of mine is am I going to get paid this month? Mm. There's um, so listening to you talk about uh, you know marketing automation. Let's 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 say the Martech umbrella. Um, and to Brian, your point about uh, you know building or buying tech as well in this case to be more efficient. I feel like we've seen this evolution, particularly in the in the marketing software space, where these tools were designed and built to make people's lives more, more easier, more, more efficient. But now we've reached this this point where there are so many applications. There are uh, so many applications that one brand might be using, you know, 70 or 100 different applications with so much overlap that actually as a whole, like for little tasks, there might be a lot of efficiency, but as a whole, it's creating a whole lot of inefficiency and challenges in terms of making customer data actionable from one platform or one application to, to another. And at what point do we say enough is enough? It all needs to be, you know, thrown away and we start again. And to add to that, how much leeway, how much input does IT have in that? The businesses come to you and say, we want this. Yeah. How much opportunity do you have to to push back? I'll, and I'll and just you... say, no, no, you don't want this. Yeah. You really right. don't. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I, I worked in a call center once where, um, because we were in a call center and we logged into our computers and logged into our phones, they knew every second of every day and how we spent it on break, on calls, on hold, on this, on that. And they had this one report, the every breath you take report, hmm. where they could report on everything a, a representative did. Was this compiled by IT because of the novelty of look what we can do? And, and you know, sometimes I think there, there's that novelty aspect in IT and development and versus was it built because the business team went to them and said, we need this. And, and IT said, yeah, we can do this. Not, well, what are you going to use it for? I mean, the, the lesson for me with that report was, just because you can measure something or in IT and novelty, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, if you're not going to act on it, if you can't apply it. So I come back to how much leeway, how much pushback does IT have? How much say do you have in that process? Or are you just tasked with executing? Unfortunately, I think the norm, Rob, is that we don't have a lot of say. Uh, in my experience, those, you know, some of those scenarios, there's 
been someone else in the organization that said, hey, I think we have a problem or, hey, if I bring in a solution, I might get promoted. And so I'm going to bring in a solution. I'm going to start to talk to sales folks. I'm going to start to, you know, go out to dinners and the golf course and those sorts of things with, and I'm not picking on sales representatives, but that's kind of how we, it, it typically plays out is we found this solution, right? We are sold on it. This is going to solve all of our problems that we ever had and will ever have. And we've allocated budget and we've signed the contracts. Hey, IT, install this and do it as soon as you can. Usually it's at that point in the conversation that IT comes in. It's like, what? I had no idea that this even existed, that this was a problem, that you were even. But now you're going to you know, sign us up for a $200,000 a year license or, or something along those lines. Um, and so unfortunately, that's typically how we see it play out in a lot of organizations. Now, I am seeing it shift a little bit in the industry because we are seeing, you know, how that doesn't necessarily play well. Um, and then for me, I again, uh, as part of my job, I need to try and find ways to make friends with those decision makers, those folks that are really, you know, early on in that process. I really kind of want to understand it so that I can kind of keep my ear to the ground, if you will, and, and see where things are going. And when I can do that, then hopefully, you know, maybe I can help steer us in the right direction. And a lot of that is is leadership and communication and has nothing to do with technology at the end of the day. So you coach um, startups as well through Techstars, I believe you mentor. Um, when, what are some common misperceptions you've encountered about software development specifically with startups and how do you uh, address them sometimes from a technical startup point of view but i'm thinking more so the the non-technical startup when they think oh there's just an easy button that can be done how do you mentor them in to help them understand what it is there for and what they can do you're probably going to sense a, a theme here, but I always go back to what is it that we're trying to solve, right? And a lot of times, technical or non-technical folks, we just we we try and find the technology to solve the problem without a clear understanding of the problem. So a problem well defined is a problem half solved. And so, really, what we see a lot of times in in these startups is that we start to build something, we start to build something. Mm -hmm. And we're not validating that idea. We're not going out and talking to our customers. We're not making sure that the thing that we're we're building or the way we're building it or the way that we're targeting our, our uh, potential customers, all of that is right. And so we spend a ton of time and a lot of resources uh, in building this thing, but we haven't actually spoken to someone about, is this the thing that we need to solve? And so I spend a lot of time with uh, my founders in just making sure that we're headed in the right direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, another one, uh, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Brian. Uh, just one more that I see a lot uh, hurt uh, non-technical founders is around ownership of their code and their the software systems that they're being are being built. Especially if founders go out and hire somebody, hire a freelancer or hire a development agency and they don't maintain ownership they can be in big, big trouble. The startup that they're, you know, everything that they're building it on, that that software can go away. They can completely lose access to something that they've paid all sorts of time and, and money to, to build. They can completely lose. And so we see that a lot, unfortunately. Mm. I, I just wanted to, um, I think there's a problem with uh, my LinkedIn pairing with Restream because I noticed there's a couple of comments not quite sure when they were made, but because you know this this show is really about the audience, I wanted to give them a give them a shout out. So um, Andrew Rice, who's been a guest on the download previously, uh, he works in cybersecurity. Mm. Uh, he, he was saying the ball of mud that never gets rebuilt for fear of breaking. I've seen this a number of in a number of industries. They prefer to write a wrapper around it. Is that 
mean anything to you. <laughs> oh, a- absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You hear spaghetti code, big ball of mud. Um, those are, are very common analogies for a lot of software systems that we get to uh, work with every day. You get, you get the joy of unraveling. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we usually just uh, kind of brush it to the side and then build something new and fancy next to it. Yeah. Or like he says, a rapper. Yeah. Yeah. And then David Todman, um, a fellow at the ISP, works within sales and marketing training. Uh, He says, interesting as an engineer by original education, we have a new product slash application process like StageGate to refine and define a new product or process to ensure fit for purpose and commercialization. Nice. Yeah. Cool. What? Thanks, David. Can, can you put that in English? Yeah, I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> what was he saying there, Brian? Uh, really, um, I think we're seeing this a lot in organizations, especially bigger organizations. It's, it's almost a justification for what is it that you're building. So instead of kind of just giving a team of developers time and and money to kind of just go off and solve these problems that may be half understood. Uh, There's really like we're spending more time up front to understand what is it that we're building? Why are we building it? What's the business justification? And how can we tie that to a, a return on investment? What is that ROI that we're expecting? And us paying a million or $2 million, which is very, very common for most enterprise uh, internal applications. Is it worth the, that return on investment? What are we going to see from that? And it may or may not be. And so then a lot of companies that I've seen, they'll use that as a driver for then asking the question, well, what do we need? What is the easier solution that gets us, uh, to the same point? That's how I took it. Hopefully that's right. Yeah. I assumed that there would be some sort of minimal viable product um and there would be a do you mean an mvp an mvp sorry am i supposed to talk in (laughs) no we don't want tlas um so i I assume there might be you know you you'd start off with a maybe a minimal viable product um and or do a sprint and at that point work out whether you want to do it or not Mm -hmm. and the stage gate yeah to see who wins, you do a sprint to see who wins, and then yes, whoever yes, wins. Alex, you do a sprint to win. Isn't that what something arranged by procurement? <laughs> so, Brian, for non technical professionals interested in gaining a better understanding of software development, what learning resources or strategies might you recommend? Um, I mean we kind of talked about it a little earlier we're almost overwhelmed by the amount of content that's available uh i'm a big proponent of podcasts um you know youtube university if you will so really going out there and finding um great information uh really starting with you know uh, almost like a dummy's guide to you know kind of fill in the blank type of technology uh really looking and and doing some Google searches. There are a lot of great articles. Um, I don't have any that kind of come to mind as like the um, primary ones, but I would start to look for podcasts and YouTube videos and and books and blog articles that really speak to a non-technical person. And a lot of what uh, you're going to see is a an analogy between what do we experience in real life and what is the technology term that we're kind of hearing all the time and often confused by and kind of bringing those two together. If you find a resource that has that, that kind of translation, um, those are really, really powerful. Brian, this has been fantastic. Thank Thank you very much. Um, We really appreciate your insights. Uh, You were able to dumb it down for me. Thank you for that. I understand, well, most of it anyway. (laughs) Um, But how can people find out more about you? How can they uh, get in touch with you? Yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you all for letting me be here and join you today. Uh, The best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Um, I'm most active there. I'm posting regularly, having a lot of conversations in the DM. So I encourage everyone to kind of reach out, connect, and, and send me a message. Happy to chat. Excellent. Well, for um, our panelists, for our guest, uh, I want to thank the audience for their 
active participation in today's session. If you have something to say, if you want to be a part of one of our next digital download episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Visit us at digitaldownload.live and click on the Be Our Guest or scan the QR code on screen now. Brian, again, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, Ron. Adam, Alex, Tim, as always, thank you. This has been another edition of the Digital Download, which is the longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live, now globally syndicated. Awesome. He can be taught. Fantastic. <laughs> Eventually. It's only taken three years, mate. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much, and we will see you next time.